Database scaling is one of the most important topics with system design, and that's because for any large scale application, the database is usually gonna be where your performance bottleneck is. And that's because while your application servers are essentially stateless, so you can scale them horizontally as much as you need, all those servers are gonna be hitting the database for retrieving data or writing new data. So what I'm gonna be going over is some basic um, and the simplest ways to improve database performance and then some more complicated stuff like replication and partitioning. A key piece of information to keep in mind when you're planning out how to scale your database is that most web apps and applications in general are very read heavy. It's usually around 95%. And if you think about that, something like Twitter one large account they write once to the database to create a tweet but that one tweet can be read and retrieved from the database millions of times um, same thing for facebook with posts on there and google when they index a piece of information that uh, the metadata of that web page isn't going to change very frequently but a lot of people are going to be making searches for those web pages so in almost all cases you're going to want to um, prioritize and build around the idea that your databases are gonna be receiving a lot more reads than writes. So these are the simplest ways to start off on trying to improve the performance of your database, and I'll just go over them one by one. So the easiest is obviously vertical scaling. You don't have to change anything, you literally just move your database to a bigger server so that it has a faster processor or more memory. You then have indexes, so what happens with this is that you create an index based on a certain column that's frequently accessed, so it could be something like the user ID or um, something like that. It speeds up read performance by creating an index that speeds up the lookup, so it doesn't have to do full table scans across your database. Um, the downside is that writes and updates become slightly slower, and that's because every time you update a row, you also have to potentially modify the index. And you also require more storage for a table that's indexed because you have to store the index itself. Denormalization is where you actually go against a standard best practice with relational databases and you add redundant data to tables so that it reduces the amount of joins you need to do, which improves your read performance. Uh, downside is once again, we're sacrificing write performance and we're risking inconsistent data across tables because um, if you have something that, let's say, it's in two tables now, you have to somehow figure out a way so that those values, when you write to one table, it also changes that data in the second table where the data is also located. Otherwise, you could get a situation where somebody tries to retrieve the data and the value is actually different in two different places. So you then have inconsistency, which for certain applications could be a major issue. The other factor is that the code becomes harder to write because you have to um, deal with that situation where you're not only writing to one table, but you have to update that data in every place that that column is now located. Um, usually that's abstracted away by some sort of library, but you obviously, somebody has to create that library to handle that. Connection pooling is a pretty simple thing to do. Um, kind of a metaphor or way to think about it is it's like carpooling where everybody just rides in the same car to save resources or save money. Um, in this case, what hap what's happening is that instead of every application thread using its own connection, they're pooled together and kind of use the same one. So it saves on overhead of independent connections to your database. One of the most important ways to scaling your database server is actually not directly related to the database at all. It's called caching. And what the cache does is it sits in front of your database and it can serve traffic from memory rather than having to read from disk. And what this does is drastically improve performance. So for example, on a, you have a client requesting data. For the first request, it would have to pass through the cache because it's not located there and get it from the database, but then um, the database or the cache would store that result and for any subsequent um, requests the cache would serve that directly and it's basically the best way of scaling your database is to not let traffic reach your database at all 
and cache because if you're familiar with the difference between like um, random access memory, RAM, um, it's much faster than reading it off of whatever storage you're using. Facebook, for example, it's pretty much the most important part of their infrastructure. They released a paper about caching in 2013 that said about 99% of their requests are served from cache. And it's pretty much the most important part of their system because anytime their cache servers went down, the uh, databases could just couldn't handle all that traffic hitting them. So their entire um, goal of engineering is basically to protect their databases from all that traffic using their cache. Uh, the only real issue with caching is that you can't uh, use everything with the cache. So dynamic data that's frequently updated, it's not going to work very well. And that would be something like real-time driver's location. It's getting updated every couple, every couple seconds. So you're going to have to keep hitting that database to get that data. So that's pretty much it for what you'd call easy wins. And now if you have to continue to scale your database, um, you're going to have to start doing more complicated stuff and start making trade-offs. And that involves replication and partitioning. So your first option is going to be read replicas. And the way this works is that you essentially duplicate your databases and you have what's called a master. This will handle all new incoming write data. And then you have replicas that handle anything requesting data. These handle it to take, um, take traffic load off this master. The issues that come in with this are that um, you run into consistency issues. So let's say something goes wrong in your data center, this connection between the master and the replica is broken, and now you have client requests coming in, and this, because it's not being updated, will have stale data. So depending on your application, that could cause big issues. It could frustrate users because they're seeing the same stuff. They're not getting access to the newest data or the most recent data. And that involves, to take care of that problem, you have to do a, put a lot of engineering effort to handling, um, detecting when a database is down, bring it back up, rerouting traffic to your other databases. Um, a side benefit of this, though, is that you have built-in fault tolerance because, um, like I said, if one of these goes down, you no longer have just a single um, database handling everything. So even if one of these goes down, you still have these backups. So an additional benefit, and to handling more traffic is that you also have fault tolerance in the case of some sort of error. Now we move on to partitioning and the first type which you probably heard about is called sharding. So this is horizontal partitioning where the schema of your table stays the same but it's now split across multiple databases. The big reason for this would be if your read replica setup you need to handle more writes so you split this up, so in this case we'd be doing it by like name of the user, so you have letters A through M. Uh, people's names A through M are stored on this shard, and this one, N through Z, is stored here. Um, the big upside, of course, is that you can now handle more traffic. The downside is um, what's called hotkeys, so um, let's say like XYZ, those names aren't going to have as much traffic as certain other letters, so it can result in uneven traffic if you're not careful about how you're sharding your database. Uh, you also have issues that you can't join across these shards because the data is separate. If you do, it's going to be very slow. A famous example like a hotkey issue was Instagram. They talked about it with Justin Bieber, so his name or his uh, user ID had way more traffic than the average user and there's really no good way to handle whenever he'd post a picture their servers would go crazy so that's um, in some cases there's really no good way to actually handle uh, sharding you just have to kind of deal with it so sharding was horizontal partitioning you also have the option of a vertical partition so in this case you're actually dividing up the schema or schema of your database into separate tables um, typically that would be done by functionality. If you have one big row of user data and you realize looking at your um, analytics that in some cases certain amounts they're not really used together, it would make sense to split those apart so that you're not retrieving um, a bunch of extra data you don't need. And also it would reduce the size of each database because you're essentially, in this case, splitting it in half. Um, examples of this is once again Instagram, 
Um, in their case, they actually completely split off the light counts for photos from everything else. So it has its own custom data store so that they can have the performance they want for um, light counts on a user's photos. Generally, this is easier to implement than sharding, but the downside is that you could potentially end up having to um, shard or horizontally partition anyway, and then it can get really complicated because you've already vertically partitioned and now you, uh, even though you try to avoid it, you still have to shard anyway. So by this point, we've pretty much destroyed everything um, it's considered a benefit of a relational database. Normalized data is gone. Strong consistency is gone. A simple data model is also gone. So we've made so many trade-offs trying to scale this that it's almost re unrecognizable compared to a standard SQL sta uh, setup. Uh, in this case, it's one you might consider some sort of no SQL database. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is the reason you choose this isn't because no SQL or no SQL is magical. It's the fact that upfront you know what you're sacrificing. When you start off with a relational database, um, you kind of thought you'd stay with all the best practices, and by the time you've ended up scaling, you've already lost all that. So the reason you choose a NoSQL database is that you know exactly what you're gonna be sacrificing, you know um, what specifically you need for your application that you can make a trade off, so if you're doing something with like transactions and banking, you obviously want consistency. Uh, but for stuff like Google or social media where you don't need um, perfect consistency right away, you could make those trade-offs for scale. So it's kind of the devil you know. With, S with no SQL, you upfront are making the choice, and that way you don't have any surprises down the road. With that said, I'll be going over in depth um, no SQL versus SQL databases or relational databases in a future video. So be sure to subscribe if you're interested in that. Uh, if this helped you out, hit like. It helps out my channel a lot. And if you have any questions, be sure to leave a comment below.